You're listening to the Academy Podcast, presenting an innovative curriculum for personal growth. Sit in on exclusive conversations with influential people as they share the secrets that made them the front runners in their industries. Now, here are your hosts, Austin and Kagia. Once again, welcome to the AP with Austin and G. He's Austin. I'm G. What's going on, man? How you doing? Man, I'm feeling good, brother. I'm doing doing all right today. I see that you switched it up. You you and your you and your uh, your, your nice shirt and your, your tie. You look good. I just kind of wonder if if you got on shorts, man. You got look. Not today. It's none of your business. It's none of your business what I have on. He has man. on shorts, I, man. That's it. That's it. I I can have on purple and gold striped pajama pants. With That's some it. big Under- red clown shoes, underneath, but but the suit, but but the, the shirt and tie looks good, man. Man, I'm gonna tell you, I'm, I'm I'm dressed because man, the reality is, man, I've been wearing t-shirts every day. I've I been wearing it. gym clothes like full time, and it's right. sometimes, man, I'm looking in my closet. There's a it's whole side good. of my closet just just neglected. Yeah, I get like, that. Man, I, I remember I used to wear that. <laughs> I get that, so man. You, you, have, you have to bring it back. You know, we're not we're not on our typical job, or we're standing in in front of people talking, so we. We're on the computer, man. We're either in polos or wearing some nice shirts, man. But the shirt looks good. The tie looks good, man. You, well, thank you, sir. It's clean, brother. What's go- so what's going on in your world? Hey, man, just um, just just I'm tripping because like the last few days, I've been on a few different things, mm-hmm. and they're not local, but I haven't gone. It's just this whole different paradigm, man. It's being yeah. able to to be at camp meet in one place. Uh, with folks from 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 all over the states, and then uh, preaching for somebody somewhere else, and right. and I'm still at home, so I'm just I'm just kind of traveling all over without traveling. So there's some, yeah. I mean, you know, when you I love traveling, right? Don't get me wrong, you know, when I <laughs> and I love traveling and working. I right. don't know about you, but this is what preachers would say sometimes. Yeah, when I'm coming, like if I'm on vacation and I'm in your town, I'll preach. Right. I don't mind preaching. I right. have fun preaching. So right. but they'd be like, well, you're on vacation, man. You can just chill. No, nah, no, nah, I'll, I'll, I'll preach. I'll do the same way. I'll preach for you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Preaching gives me juice, yeah. dude. I love it. Yeah, definitely. So, um, I, 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 But now, so now I've been kind of traveling without traveling. Right. So I don't get the benefit of going anywhere, but I'm still. And, and relaxing, having a good time, spending time. Right. Yeah. When but we, I still I still enjoy the preaching part, you know. I so. get that. I definitely get that. You know, it's kind of crazy, yeah. too, because. All of us kind of have that same feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm preaching for so-and-so, but I'm going to be right at home. You know what I'm saying? So I just preached for one of my boys in California. I would have wished I was in California, but I was sitting right here <laughs> in this seat, man. So, um, yeah, it's it's, it's kind of it's interesting. Everything is kind of taking a shift a little bit. But, I'm, I'm you know, this is as we kind of have, have, have progressed into the podcast. We first talked talk a couple episodes before we talked about how it's a new transition. I'm actually just getting a little comfortable, man, getting into it. Now I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, what's it going to be like when we get back? So we have a lot of things that we've kind of really begin to do and it's gone well. Yeah. And listen, it goes both ways. Now, you know, I'm, I can travel and preach for other people, but now we can, we've interviewed people from all over, you know, right. we could bring people in as well. So, right. so, right, you know, right, right. I can't complain. And I love to being able to sleep in my own bed. That's you know. a fact. That's a fact. That's a fact, man. We, we got somebody else today, bro. Uh, uh, one, of, one of your homeboys who, who is also a person who travels all around the world, man. We, we got somebody uh, who is not a stranger to many viewers. We're going to bring him on. We are so grateful and thankful to have Dr. Ty Douglas with us. He is the right. associate professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis of the University of Missouri. So, man, I'm just so excited. Dr. Ty, bro, how, how you feeling, man? What's good, fellas. How you doing, man? Good to see you, brothers. Glad to be on. Yeah, excited to just hang out with you for a few moments. I feel yeah. you, the traveling piece. Yeah. Um, I'm enjoying being home with the fam. I feel like many of us are trying to be omnipresent, man. You could be in multiple meetings, multiple countries on the same, same time, day. man. At the same time, it's, it's good. What's going on hey. in your world, man? How you feeling, man, today? You, you feel, you, man, you look good. The, I love the shirt you got on, man. This, this, hey, listen, I just want to say all our viewers, those who are not looking, we got three dark-skinned kings on here, man. I just want to say the dark skins are up by 10. Shout out to all of my brothers of the dark skin culture. Uh, our president Morris Chestnut would be very proud of us today. So we we all look good, man. We praise God for that, man. Absolutely. Did you say Morris Chestnut, man? He is, he is the president. He's the chief officer. <laughs> uh, man, let, man, when I when I what you know, because dark skin wasn't in when I was young. Yeah, yeah. Right you know, in. light light yeah. was right, and you know we got joked on. You know, we got leftovers. But Everybody at some point, when 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 Big Daddy Kane came out, 
when Dominique was playing ball and we yeah. had Big Daddy Kane mm -hmm. at the same time, that all of a sudden, boy, they started looking my way. Yeah, and it, 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 but don't forget that you can't forget your man Wesley Snipes. But I have to agree with Austin, man. Uh, you know what I'm saying? My guy. Chestnut, he was the one that gave us that ultimate switch. We, we look at things for real. Ladies fell in love with the dark skinned brother after Morris Chestnut, man. I'm telling you right now, man. That's that's 100%. it. 100%. That's it. But yo, yo, Ty, man, thanks again for being on. Um, uh, man, what's going on in your world today, man? What's been, how, how you been feeling? Man, I'm just grateful, man. Um, just excited to be on with you, brother. There's lots happening in our world, you know. What I mean, it's like there's lots to be done. I mean, I'm, I'm in a season where it's just it's not enough hours in the day, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, facts, man, I'm just reflecting on everything that's happening in our world. You know, uh, Rashad Brooks, his family is laying him to rest today. So, like, I'm ha that, I feel that. Uh, I'm thinking about the young brothers in my city. You know what I mean? It was a shooting in my city Friday night. Mm. Uh, I, I know these guys, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm, I'm thinking about that. You know what I mean? So I've got a lot in my heart, but I'm still hopeful uh, and just excited to be on with you, brothers, man. So this is a really important time, like, in our, in our human experience and our human family. So I'm just grateful to be a part of this conversation because I know it's more than talk. We're trying to be about, about that work. So yeah, great, for sure. uh, great to be on. Yeah, man, you jumping off into it, man. So let me let me just go there because what's kind of astounding me a little bit about you is that you don't have to be really in tune with everything that's going on. You have, you've made it to a place where it's not necessarily happening to you and right there at, on your doorstep. Right. But you are still very much aware and involved with what's happening um in in the community so so uh, is that that something that comes natural for you or something you made a decision to do how did how is it that you're so in tune with what's going on yeah man well the reality is man first of all uh i'm a product of a village you know what i mean like my you know all before the, the doc that you know i'll never forget you know where i started i started you know inside of the room of a 19 year old college freshman at oakwood uh, and she nearly had an abortion. You know what I'm saying? She literally thought about it. She was at the abortion clinic and she said she felt me move for the very first time, G, while she was at the abortion clinic and knew she couldn't do it. Right. And so from from that moment, like I've always had this sort of something that something within me in the words to take six, you know, what I mean, like to move. Right. And so uh, it's who I am. I, I, I this is this is who I am. I've been blessed, you know, what I'm saying to be a part of, 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 of a village of people being born and raised in Bermuda. Uh, and, and frankly, man, you know, the reality is that. I may have, you know, had some professional accomplishments. You know, I'm blessed to have a beautiful family like many of you, um, but I don't take that for granted. Uh, I consider myself no better than anybody else. And frankly, I have two sons. And, you know, when the police pulls me over or if I'm on the streets, nobody asks them to say anything. You know what I'm saying? So the struggle never ends for me. And the struggle yeah. never ends for our people. So I, I'm standing on the broad shoulders of others who sacrifice for me. I won't stop. Can't stop. Mm -hmm. Won't stop, man. So that's 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 just a life commitment for me. I think that's the mentality we have to have. The can't stop, won't stop. This is something that it cannot go away. We, we're not going to allow it to go away. I think that one of the things that's critical, we don't usually in the past, something will happen. And then a week later, the news cycle changes. But this has got to be before us. And I think what's helping us is that it's not just us um, in terms of when I say us. It's not just uh, African-Americans, but we have over 18 different countries. Who have stood with signs in the streets you know what i'm saying and so it's a beautiful thing that's taking place uh but I, I, i'm thankful for the type of mentality that everyone is taking and i just appreciate the fact that we can just have these conversations because what it says is we are not afraid to address the issues that are before us and we're not afraid to speak out against things that are right absolutely yeah for sure yeah, and, and, yeah G. and not to make light of it but but it's funny how you know we work so hard to get out the hood and and but really, when we get out the hood, we have to still look out for the hood. Right. And so and so can you help others? I, I know you say for you is because that's where you came from. Yeah. So so you you know your, where you came from. So you'll never forget. But but can't I mean, can you relate or even uh, you have students who their situation is, man, I got out of that place and I'm gone. I got a new lifestyle. I don't have to see that. Maybe I'll go back Christmas, but that ain't, you know, that ain't where I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be with my cousins and them, you know, wallowing in what they wallowing in. I got something else going and I, and I want to keep separate from them. Yeah. Maybe it's just the type of people I rock with, man, but I don't really know a lot of people that look like me who think like that. Um, you know, I find, you know, I'm, I teach in a predominantly white institution. So, you know, uh, a lot of my students, especially these are future teachers and, and administrators, you know, I have the opportunity to help to shift their minds around these issues. So if anything, you know, I spend a lot of time 
challenging them to think about why they need to care about our spaces, why they need to be, you know, unpacking their privilege and understanding anti-racist perspectives, right? So, um, but the folks who look like me, most, I mean, most black folks that I know, man, like we don't, we don't, we don't typically forget where we came from. Cause you know what I'm saying? It's just, that's just not how we rock. I mean, there are some, I mean, you know, and crazy enough, typically Fox News finds the ones that are like that, right? You bring them on. I was on the other day for brother. I'm just like, bro, come on. Like, what are you saying? Like, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So, you know what I mean? He's from Barbados. I was born and raised in Bermuda. And I'm like, let's, let's, let's have an honest conversation, even not just about the African-American experience, but come on, talk to us about your, your, your island experience, right? And so pushing folks to even think about like how and when you came to this country is very different, G. It's very different, Austin, if you came here on Delta, yeah. if you came here under the bowels of a boat. You know what I'm saying? If you came here 40 years ago looking for a new life, that's different if you were forced to come here and change. And so I'm pushing our people to really understand and think about not just space, but how you come into a space, how you are introduced to a space, all of that matters. So if anything, like I, I teach in a space where I challenge my white brothers and sisters, including my Christian brothers and sisters, right? Because I'm actually a lay pastor of a church here and I'm in the state conference. So for the last eight years, I've been helping to try to push my brothers and sisters to say, listen, I know you love me. I know you say you love my sons, but like Mike Brown's no different from me. You know what I'm saying? I should have gone literally to the exact same school district, the Normandy school district as Mike Brown. Deep, bro. My biological father is literally from St. Louis. So I'm like, wow. I'm like full circle, almost, you know, 40 plus years later, I'm back in my father's state. And he was supposed to be a pastor, G. Austin, yeah. he was supposed mm. to be, you know what I'm saying, doing what I'm doing. But God, you know what I'm saying, his life didn't turn out that way. You know what I'm saying? He died prematurely. But mm. now, 40 years later, I'm back and I'm able right. to do the things that he was supposed to do. So I can never just be comfortable, but I can never also be comfortable with folks around me being comfortable with, 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 with the challenges in our community and just turning a blind eye. It can't happen in my presence. All right, tell me, maybe I, it's propaganda. Uh, as you say that, what I'm thinking about is the fact that if I'm looking at what's being uh, presented uh, through media a lot of times, then I may be seeing people who are portrayed like what I just portrayed. And when in actuality, uh, most of us ain't like that. You know, because you ain't like that, I ain't like that. Austin ain't like that. And so, and now when you say the people I rock with, and then I start thinking, I guess the people I rock with ain't like that either. But I guess that some people on in the media are are, are, are like that. Um, yeah. And yep. so maybe that's... For sure. And I think we could say the same thing even about narratives around Black fathers. Like, I did a show this, this past week about Black fathers, and the thought came to me, I said, like, yo, I can't really think about any, any Black man I know who are bad fathers. Like, I don't know many, you know what I'm saying? But if you hear the narratives, and that's to say they don't exist, but the narrative is typically one that's deficit-based if you listen to the media about our communities, our families, our neighborhoods. But the reality is, I believe there's a lot of positive things that are actually the norm, but typically the focus of the media is to shift that towards something that's not always representative of the best of us. Man, you slapping you slapping us right in the face, Doc. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I like to think, I like to think that <laughs> I've never gone for the okie doke. I like to think I've never believed just what I seen, you know. But the reality is, man, you just opened my eyes. Cause yeah. cause I kind of I kind of believe the hype yeah. or, or, or believe somebody else's narrative. We, yeah. we gotta watch that. I yeah. mean, look, let's go a little step further. Think about how many black men you know that have also taken on other people's children in the words of Lisa Delpit. Like not only do we father our own kids, right. but like, right. not even, I'm not even just talking about coaches, barbers, like the folks, I'm talking about literally men who have married sisters or, or, or partnered with sisters and raised other people's children as them. And that was my story. That's yeah. my story as, as, a, as, a, as, a, right. as a man, as a boy being raised by my dad who took me in. And I right. also have a 26 year old son, right? And so like, that's what we do. But nobody tells that story. So again, no. it's important that we rethink the narratives that are that are framed about our communities. And I, I think fathers and men like that, they actually it, it does change the story. I think they don't get highlighted enough for a brother who takes on kids that aren't his, raise them as his own, shows up to every baseball game, goes to the basketball games, is there for the church events. And th that doesn't get highlighted. I think the narrative overall is just because you are of a certain color, because you are part of a certain street. I, listen, I like wearing hoodies when I go out places. I like wearing my Jordans when I... I like being in a t-shirt and a cap. I, that's I, I don't want to be in a suit all of the time, even though I'm, I'm passing. My wife says even now, though, I, it doesn't matter if I'm in a suit or if I'm running down the street with my shorts on. It don't matter. I'm still a threat to certain people in their eyes. And we have to continue to push a different narrative that just because I'm a different color does not mean I'm necessarily a threat to you. 
All right, now you're talking about narratives that kind of kind of transitions us because um hey man, I got a I got a question for you really cuz I've been reading some of the stuff you put out. You finished your doctorate and and I'm one that haven't. And, and it seems like when I'm looking at 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 my friends, if I when I'm looking at at, at writers, most of you all have your doctorates and you're prolific and it's well written. And and my question is, because I hadn't finished, is there something in the process of getting my doctorate that makes me a prolific writer? <laughs> or, <laughs> or or were you guys that finished, you know, went through it, did it, and got it, you already had it in you. That's why you were able to get it so quickly. I mean, I, 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 what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I just, I just want to know because... Right. Man, I've been working on mine for a while and I ain't finished yet. But you brothers has finished your doctors, man. You guys are really writing some good stuff. And 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 because you're writers, now you have an opportunity to write the narrative. Mm. Right. That's yeah, true. That's good. Yeah, that's good. You know, it's interesting. I, I think it's a both Angie. To be honest with you, I um man, some of the most dopest, strongest scholars that I know don't have a PhD, don't even have a master's. They may have a bachelor's, if that, right? Uh, so I want to definitely shout out. You know, our scholars, our leaders who I have never, um, you know, what I'm saying, you know, uh, uh, sort of taken on the 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 the, the, the higher ed context, um, the traditional higher ed context, because as a scholar, frankly, one of my commitments is the power of community based pedagogical spaces. That's what I call them. That's a mm. fancy therapy uh, in Austin for uh, spaces like the barbershop, the church, the neighborhood, the, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the soccer club, the basketball court. Like, I think one of the things that's important, especially for me who, as a person who has some privilege in being in these higher ed spaces, these ivory towers, is to also shout out and acknowledge those who are just as smart, doing even just as important, if not more important work, and are not in these spaces, but are writing, are, that are producing. That said, to your question, um, I think there is something about the process of, you know, having to write a dissertation, uh, that, I mean, a dissertation in and of itself is effectively a book if you think about it strategically and if you write it in such a way that you can, you know what I'm saying, do the pivot and then produce it as a book, right? So there are there are perks to the process of having to do it. But then I would also add, you know what I mean, for me, I've always been a writer. Like I've always, you know what I'm saying, wow. I, oh, cool, my undergrad was in English, my master's was in English, I taught, you know, middle school, high school English. Um, but being around other writers, you know what I'm saying? Being around other scholars and just being in a, in a, in a space where um, where it's not you're not just writing for yourself, but you recognize that there is actually spaces where your work is valued. It just creates a context where you want to be productive. You know what I'm saying? Right. So for me, uh, I would say it's a both am. Uh, I definitely there's some benefits to the process, but I would never put a, a degree up on a pedestal um, to the extent that it minimizes the, the brilliance and excellence that many of us have even before we get the official titles or go through the pipeline of higher ed. Okay, okay, but let me clear this up before we move. We're gonna move, but let me clear this up first. Okay. Because I heard you say, you know, you don't wanna put the degree on the pedestal. And and I, I often hear people negating the importance of the degree. Mm. And I, I, look, I've already, and I ain't finished yet, I already spent $50,000. So don't tell me I've wasted my money. I mean, there's something that happens in the process of education that is important, that does mean something, and that is worth the $50,000 and the countless hours that I spent trying to reach it. Absolutely. And so I know a lot of times people say, I don't care if you have a PhD, a MD, a CCD. Listen, yeah. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's worth the money I paid for it and, um, and the work I put into it. Well, and, and let's be clear, right? I mean, there are some some people who don't care about it. There are some people who, um, you know, they, they will minimize it and you may not even need it to be engaged. But there are some spaces where I get in as Dr. Douglas um, that I wouldn't get in if, if it's just tied. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. some, so it does get, give access. My dad said to me, he said, listen, son, sometimes you have to do things, and this is his words, so that fools will listen to you. That was his words before I did my PhD. He's like, listen, son, like sometimes, you know, because the things that, you, that are in you, you, I mean, they're already in you, but but if if a title behind your name or if it's packaged a particular way, this is the thing, G. Like my dissertation, bro. I mean, it got awards and all that. But can I just be honest with you? Like it literally also came out of my journey. Like I, I wrote right. about was in you shops, churches, right, neighborhoods, athletic spaces. Those are the four spaces that helped to preserve me. When yeah. my mom came back home, you know what I'm saying, as a 19 year old freshman. Like those are the spaces that nurtured me. So what am I saying? 
I'm saying, similar to what we've already talked about in the conversation, there is power. There is power, wonder working power, not just in right. the practice of blood, but also in our communities, like in right. the stuff that helps to preserve us in this crazy white supremacist world. There's some places that preserve us that's, and there's some stuff that's already in us that when we package it the right way, we can also navigate these higher spaces and people are like, oh, community-based pedagogical space. Oh, that's so profound. Right. I'm like, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. But right. I guarantee you, I got that from my barber and he didn't actually even go to college. Right, right. That was in the hood. That was exactly in the hood, right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, you know, um, when you look at cities like DC, Atlanta, um, Chicago even, you see the issues of gentrification that take place. You know, it was when you go into cities that you know used to have predominant hoods and now they've got large landscapes there. They've got expensive homes and we can kind of see uh, Caucasian people kind of beginning to move in. What what do you see the issue is with that? What are, is there anything that we can do as a community when it just kind of seems like sometimes the rug is pulled from underneath our feet? Well, I think what's important, there has to be a, a, a historical I understand of a larger historical narrative about property, right? Mm -hmm. About um, and 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 the and the so there's a there's a theory a theory out there called critical race theory. If you ever get a chance, maybe you're familiar with it. Your listeners may be interested in looking it up. But one of the tenets of critical race theory is the significance of property in this country, but also the permanence of of racism, right? And uh, I think it's important for us to understand that before black folks could earn property, we had to stop being property, right? Uh... Before we yeah. earn property, we have to stop being property. And if you study the history of this country, you will see that there's a legacy of, of discriminatory policies that have impacted the access that black people have had to property. For example, something called red line, where you looked at you look at how black communities were undermined as it relates to the value of our houses. Not because our houses were any worse than any of the other houses that were owned by white folks, but because policies literally like 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 took the rug from under the value of our neighborhoods right. and, and, and effectively undermine our economic power as it relates to real estate and as it relates to property. So I say all that to say that when you uh, 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 couch the gentrification conversation in a larger historical narrative of not just physical property, but the fact that black folks have were first seen as property and we've always had to fight to be fully human in this space, it shouldn't surprise us when there's manipulation around values of literal property were also always trying to displace black and brown bodies right. out of places that they value. You get what right. I mean? Right. right? It's sport. So I, I want you, if you can dunk LeBron, but if if you're talking now and you're speaking of social justice issues, then shut up and just play ball. You get right, it? Right, right, so right, right. It, it's, it's not just property, but it's also navigating how and when they want to have black bodies in those spaces. I want to know you if you're an athlete on my campus for some of these folks, but I'm afraid of you if I see you in the elevator. You get what I'm saying? So it's a larger historical conversation around the value of black and brown life, which ultimately impacts how people see the value of the spaces we're in. Last thing I'll say to that, we have people in our churches, in our, especially in our, 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 our state conference spaces, who will drive and fly to far off places to go and help young brothers and sisters in a foreign land, but they miss the people who are in the black and brown spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, it connects to this larger narrative in this country uh, of the devaluing of black bodies, but also black space. So tell me about um, the process. I was looking at the, the, the your book and I was really interested in, because it's not a straightforward, you sitting by yourself and, 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 and pounding it out, but it's it's a collaboration. Just can can you tell me like what was the onus? Why'd you write it? Sure. Um, why'd you collaborate? Um, who did you collaborate with, and how did it come together? And what kinds of things did you all learn in the process? See, now this is the Academy podcast, and so now I'm gonna give you a little bit of the blueprint, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. even as it relates to, I mean, you, and I appreciate the compliments about you know being prolific, and I'll be flat out, man. God has been faithful. You know, um, I was blessed as a as a doc student to be you know, uh, as productive in six days or even more productive in six days than many of my colleagues were in seven. And that's not like something to reflect, you know, just me or whatever, but like God is faithful. And a lot of this work, man, is really connected to relationships. It's about who you know, right? It's about, uh, you know what I'm saying? That's People telling you about particular opportunities. Um, I see myself as a chaplain to higher ed. Like I, I, I minister in this space, right? And so, you know, when you have goodwill with people, they tell you about opportunities. So when I think about even my books, um, there are various ways to splice how you write, G. Austin, there are various ways that you can take, for example, um, you know, your dissertation and you can turn it into a book. That's one. Um, you can 
have an edited book where you bring together other scholars who write about a topic. And while you may frame it, while you may write the introduction, uh, or while you may write a chapter, you may not write the entire book. There are different ways right. you do it. One of the things I think has been a failure, frankly, within the Adventist church, as relates to the brilliance of our pastors, is that far too few of our pastors have, have figured out how to turn their sermons into manuscripts that become books. I mean, all those books that T.D. Jakes has written, he weren't just sitting down and just writing books one, one by one by one. He had folks who were helping to take his sermons and to transcribe them and to then contextualize for different audiences. And boom, it's a factory. They begin to come out. And so for me, uh, the, the, the book that you're referring to, uh, Campus Uprisings, How Student Activists and Collegiate Leaders Resist Racism and Create Hope, that came out of really an eight-year journey of being here at the University of Missouri, which is an epicenter uh, for the uprisings that are taking place right now. I have to remind folks that before uh, Colin Kaepernick took a knee, our student athletes stood. I don't know if you remember in 2014, 2015. That's right. Like what happened on our campus sent shutters, reverberations all across the NCAA context because these guys showed that they could bring this whole enterprise to a screeching halt. And yeah. at that time, I was actually doing a lot of work in athletics. I continue to do so, working with the NCAA, working with the NBA and other organizations. And so uh, each project that I've written has really been a reflection of either a research study, uh, a passion that I've had, um, or a collaboration with other scholars and colleagues who are doing similar work. And then you think about where do you want to put it? Not everything has to be a book. I just had a piece that came out this week in Message Magazine. It was a reflection on being a father for Father's Day. Or I may drop an article in a, in a journal. Here's the deep part is that in order to keep my job as a, at a research one uh, right. institution at time, I have to I have to publish two to three journal articles, academic journal articles every year. That's what I had to do to get tenure. And so by the time you do that over time, you recognize, you know, what I'm saying that it gets you into a habit of writing. But you also want to diversify your outlets so that you reach diverse audiences. Yeah, I, I, I love that because I think that changes the narrative as well in terms of just we're not just ball players. We're not just uh, going to be just chefs in the kitchen. We're going to be. And, and those are great things to do, of course. But we're gonna be we're gonna be scholars in the room, and I, I wanted to ask you. It seems like God has placed you there for such a time as this. What are some of the successes and the things that have kind of turned around in your favor while being at uh, at that at that at that school that you're that you're teaching at now? What are some things that you've seen God to do uh, through your ministry? Yeah. Well, first of all, man, I just want to give God praise, man, just for keeping us. I mean, I'm here by design. You know what I'm saying? I, I consider it an honor to be back in this state 40 years later in my father's state. Um, there are a number of things that stand out to me. I was blessed to get tenure and promotion uh, in a, on a truncated timeline. So I actually got it in a, a year early, which again, doesn't make sense because I've been engaging in ministry at a really high level, having planted a church here, right? And so just that alone, like that doesn't make sense. That's God, I, I don't understand it. I really don't, I can't explain it. You know what I'm saying? The number of articles, books and things that have been written as well as you know, preaching, you know, helping to build a context. So we have a nonprofit and other things that we're doing. So I just want to thank you for the sustenance and the foundation of that is I'm happily married. I have two healthy and happy sons, right? So, so for me to be in this space and epicenter for this current movement, like I like to let people know, you know what I'm saying? Like what we experienced here was a uh, 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 sort of you know, the beginnings. Uh, it was really a bookend for me, 2014 when Mike Brown was killed. So even with George Floyd's situation, this is not new. So I've learned a lot being here and then also raising up a church, Salt City Church. You see the t-shirt here. You know, we've been blessed to work with young people in our city. Uh, so we're actually heading to our seventh annual back to school explosion, man, where we actually are on a basketball court. The first year we did it, we baptized 35 young people wow. running a basketball court. We collaborated with the Grace Tour. And like, I mean, we baptized probably, you know, close to 60, 70 folks from that event over the years. And right. what we realized it was we needed a place to bring them, though, because there was no black or brown uh, uh, Adventist church in the city. And so we've been able to I've been blessed to be able to uh, lead that and, uh, and and now build an infrastructure so that it can su survive and thrive without me. That's the vision now. And so I'm excited. We've got a brother that's joining our staff. Uh, we haven't made the announcement formally yet, but uh, it's exciting because now I've got other team members who are specifically coming yeah. for this particular season post COVID. So those are the things I'm most excited about. I just say one last thing in 10 seconds. I'm grateful when I walk down the street or when I drive in the city, there are people who know that I love them, that I care about them, irrespective of their background. I have relationships, bro. That 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 matters, yeah. especially as yeah. coming from a small place. So when I, when you see me doing leading uh, our marches and all that, that's not because I'm seeking it out. I literally was prayer walking with our team on a Saturday night, and I drive into a protest 
and the young brother said, "Yo, Doctor Ty, what's up, man? I, you know, we ain't got no preachers out there. We ain't got nobody. And look, he's got a he's got a good whole, whole army of people behind him. And it's like, listen, would you come and pray and speak to the people? That turns into speaking on Saturday night. That turns into speaking on Sunday. And I speak to hundreds of people because right. I have relations with these young brothers. But we're right. on the gospel call with them every single yeah. week, loving on them. And I think what's so critical, man, is it, all of us have spoken in several different arenas and events and places and conferences. And it's all good. But I love the fact that and I, I love this. There is no greater experience than impacting the community that you work for. You have, you know, any, any preacher or leader, uh, whether you are working in the church or working for the city, you got to water your own grass, man. You just do. I do. I, listen, I love preaching at, at these conferences, but there's nothing like impacting somebody on the local level because what you're doing is that you're you're, you're changing someone's life right where you are. It's a shame, uh, and we should never get to the space to do this where we'd rather travel on the road 24 seven and not take care of our people. And at the end of the day, I think we're sent here as Christ was sent here to 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 help those meet somebody that can seek and save the lost. And I love that what you're talking about. And I see, I'm not gonna lie, Doc, you look, you get on the basketball court, man. Is that true? Do you get out with the brothers a little bit, man? Is that is that true too, Doc? Absolutely, Brian. I'm a soccer guy, man. I grew up with the soccer, okay. with the step up, but I can I, I play basketball, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Little, but for sure, man. Listen, basketball is a language, you know what I'm it saying? Is. And so you meet the brothers where they are, and so, sometimes it, I might have a broom in my hand, Austin, where I'm sweeping off the court just to make sure they don't slip down. And, and they can sense that. So a little kid who's 12 or 10, he comes up to me and says, hey, man, what's your name? I said, what's up, man? Nice to meet you, King. You know what I mean? It's Dr. Ty. I said, what? You're a doctor? I'm yeah. like, yeah, it's okay. And you can be too. What's your name? My name's John. I'm like, what's up, Dr. John? And instantly, it's affirmation. I'm saying, bro, you can do this. And by the way, I'm a professor at the university if you're interested in connecting. But also, you can connect with our church. So I get to be a bridge builder, man, where I get to bring together the best of what I've experienced and trying to create a village, man, for other young brothers and sisters who can, who can, you know, to have access to what was able to bless me. Right, right. So can can you talk about, um, can you go ahead and talk about just a little bit, and I, as you meet, meet these young people uh, on the basketball courts, on the street, can you talk about the importance of not just getting the high school diploma, you know, going to college? Um, um, what are we saying to our young generation now about that? That, that when they see the doctor, why, why is that so important today? Well, I mean, I, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. I think there's there's some things that you can get access to that you know you, you need you need that card to get in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a person like I, I while I have degrees, I, there's also I think the schooling process there's also things you need to unlearn about it, right? Like yeah. to me, I, 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 it's not a when I think about the two most significant uh, basketball icons of this current generation of the last. You know, twenty. Well, I'll say maybe yeah, maybe twenty years. I'll say twenty years. The two really that that, that, that come to mind are Kirby, um, and LeBron, right. and neither of them went to college. Right, so right. It's also interesting that schooling can also do something to you. A lot of a lot of stuff that I actually learned, Austin. <laughs> I had to learn from other people who knew the higher ed game and say, "Bro, you need to make sure that you can monetize that." Because they'll just milk you for all you. You can write your little articles, but you ain't really eating off of those. You know what I'm saying? Wow. You're not really transforming community. So what I'm really doing, most of the stuff I do outside of the university context, doesn't really show up on the Richter scale of the metrics of promotion and tenure and the like. That's what makes it so crazy that I got promotion and tenure a year early. It's like, that's a God thing. How do yeah. I do that? How can you right. be out the streets down the church and you've actually been able to write like that? That's daddy. That's straight up Holy Ghost favor. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I would say this. Um, to your question specifically, I believe that there's something valuable about getting a degree. I believe as long as you understand the degree is just a, a, a part of the process. It's it's a it's right. a it's, it's a, a matter a, a way by which you can learn skill sets. You you know what I'm saying? Because my son he asked me why I, I'm like, why do I want to have to take you know what I'm saying intro to the Bible at Oakwood or you know what I'm saying or, or, or you know I mean I want I want to study math. Why freshmen come or why do I need to learn about these different right uh, yeah articles or reading about this particular history is because it gives you the capacity to communicate to build relationships so i think the message that we really need to be telling our kids is listen let's try to stay out of debt because the real testimony yeah they have no debt yes yes that when i graduated from my master's i literally went home and started a business like right two, two months later my mom went back to school that 19 year old freshman went back to oakwood g finished her bachelor's Finish her master's, and now look at it. She's working on her doctorate at my university. Like, right. like that's the real story. The and, real story is transformation of generation. And Ty, we see that because we see even a lot of our rappers today, those who who are professional in hip hop. The one thing they're talking about now is owning property, getting rid of debt, building our communities, and especially you know our, my young people now at my church. But I'm sure G2 has had young people. They want to be basketball players, rappers, and there is absolutely nothing 
wrong with that. But I like what you said, though, is that it has to have purpose to it. You can't just rap in the studio to rap. You got to rap to make changes. So I really appreciate you saying that because especially with Black Brothers, like right now, me and my wife, we're trying to get out of debt. We're trying to work what we got to work to get out because that is going to that is going to help last in the long run for the next generation that comes after us. Yeah. Listen, you're getting played. This okie doke. If you go get degrees, I, and I'll be honest, it hurts my heart. And so one of these I've actually tried to do is to build a bridge to get young people from Oakwood and other institutions, young professionals to my city. That's also, if you ask me, go back to the other question, something that I'm excited about is that we've literally recruited over like 10 young adults who have come here, come done master's degrees, come, they've come worked in our school, right. come and finish medical degrees and, you know, or internships or whatever. And we've also now working towards sending our students, our young people from our city to the oak woods right so right. Build that rest uh, uh that, that reciprocity right and building that bridge and so i think it's important that we that the message that we're sharing is not just the monetizing piece but understanding the degree isn't really what does it there's something powerful about being in the environment like et yes, was saying sir. right get to the spot you know what i'm saying it wasn't just about um the, the class at oakwood Oak, he would tell you it took him what 12 years to get a full year degree but there was something about being in huntsville alabama from this young brother from detroit to get there there was something for me about getting from bermuda and being in the space where i could see and hear doug and i could be around g and and, and the folks who you know what i'm saying who poured into me right like there's something about being in an environment that says yes we can and many of our young brothers and sisters in these other smaller spaces around the country don't get a chance to get exposed to black accidents consistently so i think it's more about the degree it's about the exposure that allows you to reflect and say, yo, he looks like me. I can do that too. And here are the pathways to it. Last thing on that, I have a concern that many of our students graduate from our institutions. You know how we do. We turn up. We got the hat all decorated. We dance across the stage. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're dug in or dapping or whatever to, you know what I'm saying, to, to Pollard and, and Dr. Pollard and others. But these students sometimes are walking across the stage and they have no idea what to do the next day. They have Absolutely. No idea what to do it for the masters. They don't know how to go and get an internship somewhere else. And so that's the part that I'm trying to build to help our people to understand there is a pathway. There is a difference between getting my master's at um, UAH, where I went and got mine. I would, did it for free, but if I knew what I know now, yes, I would have went to Northwestern. Yes, I would have went to some other right. institutions. Not right. because they're better, but because there's something about those spaces. I'll be honest with you, I'm mad. I'm pissed, G, you know what I'm mad about? I'm mad that Obama came and went and nobody I knew was on his staff. Nobody from my generation was on his on his on his on his on his team. I don't know anybody who worked for Obama. And I'm saying that was yeah. the time. But, yeah. but our generation weren't we weren't prepared for that because we didn't even know what schools to go to. I'm looking at true. CVs and resumes of people on his staff, and I got one degree, but they went to this particular summer internship, and this was pre-internet, so they knew where to go. But our yeah. kids, I didn't know where to go. I did the best I could with what I knew. So I believe that what God has for me now, everybody has a different path. I believe that there'll be no man or woman be able to say, hey, I put that guy on. They're not going to be able to say Harvard did it. They're not going to be able to say, they're going to say, look, this brother went to Oakwood, UH, and the University of Alabama, um, um, uh, University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And I don't know how I don't know how it happened. I'll be at a point to him and say, I'll tell you how it happened. Yeah, yeah. God hey, created, God, the God of my mother's womb. That's who, that's yeah. who. And I saw you the other day on Fox News, man. And I just want to ask you about your experience, man, because, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about Fox, man, I'm, I'm looking at the belly of the beast, man. So, so <laughs> tell me about your experience on Fox News, man. Yeah, man. Well, uh, well, first, man, I, I just I just thank God for the opportunity. You know, um, there are many people that I think can speak uh, on these issues. I just happen to be the person that had that opportunity. So, you know, I, I was you know speaking on behalf of the village. It was an interesting space. You know, um, at some point I need to flash out and share it behind the scenes a bit more. But one of the things I think you'd be interested to know is like I literally only had in my ear, um, I could only hear the conversation in my ear, in my right ear. So I couldn't see uh, Malcolm McCollum. I couldn't see my colleague, uh, uh, the other gentleman who was on. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not I could only look into the camera and I could hear the conversation. So I couldn't see the B-roll um, that was playing. Uh, and literally, I, when I think about it, my wife and I were talking about it afterwards. You know, I mean, it was a moment where you know, E.T. actually says this. We talk about, you know, preparing for the opportunity of a lifetime and the lifetime of an opportunity. Like I've been preparing all my life. You know what I'm saying? I got in trouble in school for talking too much. You know what I mean? Uh, all the times I'm on the prayer line, G, and you know what I'm saying, communicating where I, I can I, I can sense like pauses and when to pause, when to talk, when to listen. And all that came into place in that conversation. Uh, and so I think, you know, the moment was powerful. But for me, I believe it's part of a larger movement. And that movement, again, goes back to my inception. Um, but it also includes life experiences, uh, you know, studying these issues. I mean, some people, the diversity experts, you know, after the last two weeks or four weeks because it's Vogue and now they're trying to just talk about these issues. But some of us have literally been studying this stuff 
for years. I literally left the classroom at Bermuda, in Bermuda Institute because I was frustrated that, yes, I was winning the battles in my classroom, but I felt like we were losing the larger proverbial war as you know, gang violence was beginning to proliferate in Bermuda at the time. And so on the book, again, uh, that's just a God thing, man. Um, I think about all that happened on my campus and being here, like I said, you know, um, this is not a Mecca, right? This is not DC. This is not, you know what I'm saying, Hunts, Hunts Vegas, right? You know what I mean? This is, right. I'll be in Missouri, but I'm a guy like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bloom by God's grace wherever I'm planted. And right. I think great things can start small, whether it's Bermuda, whether it's Columbia, Missouri. Uh, and so I was just blessed to be able to be a part of that. And I think I, all of us are standing on the shoulders of, of others that go before us. And even in the word, man, I've, I've really been drawn to and been encouraged by the story of Moses recently, man, that's really been blessing my life in this season as I feel that I'm called to say to Pharaoh, let my people go, you know what I'm saying? That they may worship. And I, I don't wanna get into it right now, but if you, if you have a quick second, man, if, if you have, before we get out, I'll love to share something with you that's been blessing my heart, man, as you lace to that. Because I think more than just even Marvin Gaye and Spike Lee, like this thing is a revolution that's being televised and it's happened before. Yeah, go, go into it right now, man. Don't wait, go into it now, man. Look, look Acts chapter four, man, um, when you got a chance, read on your own time. But like Acts chapter four, verse 27, listen, like there's, I, cause I know there are some people who have asked the question, like what do these movements have to do with, you know, uh, 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 the, you know, the three angels messages and should we be participating in protests and the like, uh, read this, read the narrative of Moses, just start from the beginning of Acts, but look at Acts chapter four, verse 27, check this out guys. It says, now the Lord had said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. And met Moses at the mountain of God and he embraced him. These are two brothers raised in slightly different contexts, one in the palace, one with the people, right? Yeah, Moses yeah. told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say, right? This is important because Moses is the one who got the word, but he's nervous. He's saying, God, I'm not sure if I'm that guy. And I want to encourage somebody who's watching because you're gifted, but you may always often have insecurities that make you feel like, are you the one? And I understand that. And Moses understands that, right? So it says, uh, he told him everything that he had, uh, that, that he had commanded him to, to say, and he told him the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to perform. Now, I like this because, you know, in our denomination, we like to talk about signs. We like to, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the revelation seminars and the stuff and the images, right? We like to focus on stuff, right? Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together, some truth telling, some conversation, some caucusing. Aaron told them, listen to this, everything the Lord had told Moses, and Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Here we go. I'm almost done. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. They were convinced. Yeah. They were convinced when they saw the signs, right? But when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them, yes, it. seeing their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. And this whole great controversy is about worship. But mm -hmm. we wanna, we wanna, what, what is it going to take for our young brothers and sisters who want to worship? It's going to take us going and saying, yo, like God has seen our pain. He's seen the oppression and he didn't want that to be our reality, but he's seen it. He cares about us and he wants, you know what I'm saying? The systems and structures and even the church to get its foot up off their neck. Yes, That's sir. when they'll worship. That's it. That's when they'll worship. That's when they'll flood into your church and come and say, yo, what must I do to be saved? Because you came right. and met my need and you didn't just show me the signs. You didn't just throw a track at me. You said, yo, I hear you. I feel you. I relate to you. Now, let me show you how we can do this thing together. So, yo, Todd, listen, man, I, I think that word on Moses is, is, is so prevalent because, um, you know, for him, he's a, he's, he's, a, he's a brother who's 80 years old when God calls him out of the desert. You know what I'm saying? To let all, over three million people go. And, and I mean, he's got a stuttering problem and God just gives him a stick. But uh, he had one vocal point. Let my people go. And he wasn't going to take take a, 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 a need of anything. He was going to stand up for whatever, man. So I appreciate you doing that analogy because I think for a lot of us, you know, standing up against injustice is biblical. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, like, like changing your community is biblical. That's what Christ did. And so, man, just thank you for, for, for bringing that up, man. And I even see in there, man, I even see in there, it wasn't just Moses. So, so Moses was the man, but then he had Aaron to help with some of his deficiencies. Yeah. And Moses and Aaron both didn't just go talk to Pharaoh, but they also grabbed the leaders 
uh, and talk to the leaders and then and, and the and the rest of the people. So it, it it was there was a lot of moving parts in there. It's not it's not a solo thing. It's not just Moses hearing the word from God going straight into Pharaoh and slapping Pharaoh in the mouth and telling him to let the people go. But right. there's a lot of people involved, and so so I just appreciate the fact the moving parts. I appreciate that because I know I got some deficiencies, yeah. but I know just because of my deficiencies, it don't mean God can't use me because yeah. He'll have somebody that He's been preparing. Maybe my own brother. He's been preparing somebody that could do the very thing that I might have a shortcoming in. And so uh, I can appreciate that, man. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, but that, that kind of, it brings me to another point, man, because we kind of talk about the problems and the issues, man. But but you alluded to something that I don't really know all the details on, but you alluded to there being some power um, that the, the, the student athletes found out they had. And so, and so that sounds like, part of the solution so i know i know we got problems and we got the same problems now that we had four years ago that we had 12 years ago that we had in 1971 that we had in eight come on 1800 and something so i understand we have those problems but it seems like you found something yeah yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna drop something here that i haven't really said in a lot of places yet um so there's a couple of things one like yeah the higher ed structure is such that um Effectively, you know, the, the, the money making uh, mechanism is really the, the black athlete because That's the sports true. that really you know bring in the revenue generated sports are you know football, men's basketball, right? Um, and those are the main ones, right? And so like you know the, the NCAA they make most of their money off of the NCAA basketball tournament, right? A lot of people don't know how that works, but again, when these athletes stood up and said, "We're not going to play unless such and such happens," <laughs> such and such happened, <laughs> right? right? And right. Uh, and, it, and, and it has the potential um, to shift, not the potential, I mean, it, it can literally shift um, not just the power structure, but also the flow of economic resources. For example, if our young athletes decided they went to start to attend HBCUs, uh, my colleague Jamal Hill, you probably know from ESPN and the like, she wrote a powerful piece on that. So she talked about it. And uh, there are athletes who are talking about this. There's a brother, Mikey Williams, who's a highly touted uh, athlete who's thinking about going to an HBCU. So I want to drop something in here because I know uh, I know, you know, I, I I know that, you know, who knows my, who knows uh, who listens to this and maybe they need to hear this, but I had a thought recently, man. I was thinking like, what would happen um, if we had an approach that we actually apologize, G, to our young black athletes, in particular, even in the Adventist church, who we celebrated athletics on Sundays, right? As we watch games with them, but we never created a context for our sons and our daughters to go to the highest level in sport. And what if? What if our Oakwood, what if our Oakwood could be a place where top athletes want to go? What if our, our black athletes decide they want to actually go and attend our HBCUs and shift the power structure as it relates to the resources coming to our places where now, you know what I'm saying? Wherever we are, the people are going to come. The cameras are going to come, but you got to get the athletes there. And so even in, in basketball, all you need is a 12 man roster. You know what I'm saying? And you really, I mean, if you got six, seven great players, you know, I mean, you, you know, you can change the context of a basketball program. So I, I share that to say, um, yes, there, there were solutions. And the fact that these young athletes stood in 2015, it gave a visual, visual and visual, ex, a vis, visual example that it literally happened. And I also want us to think about in our own structures how we can better mobilize athletics because we celebrate preachers, we celebrate singers, but we've never really harnessed the power of athleticism. And in so doing, we've communicated to our young black males and young black, young black females that an area where God has gifted us in athletics is not something that we can effectively use for him, but I believe that we can. And I think we need to do a better job of that. I'm about to, yeah. I'm about to, I'm about to give a hot take. I know G, I know you got your, if you want, I'm about to give a real good hot take. And I just, I don't want to say good. I just want to make this point. We've got to pour into our athletic departments and our Adventist institutions. Like we have got to make it okay for brothers to feel like, and our sisters too, for brothers to feel like they've got facilities, they've got gyms, they've got workout spots because we, we build up our, our, our buildings, we build up, you know, our sanctuaries. But in terms of, and I'm, I'm talking about the school that I went to. I mean, we, 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 we've been talking about it for a long time. We've got brothers who are talented, you know what I'm saying, that come onto our campus, that want to be a part. I should be able to say, I, got one, I, I go to one of the best HBCUs. We've got a great program. Nothing should be like, we've got to continue to point that because, you know, for sports like me, I, I, you know, today I ball today. I, I was out, out hooping today. I mean, 
like you said, it's a language out on the court, those type of sports. We have got to take advantage of those moments. And it makes our schools more attractive. I'm not going to lie. And, you know, for our, for our Adventist brothers and sisters, the reality is, look, your, your, your son, your daughter, they got a gift. We, listen, we're not saying they're going to go to the league. And, and if they do, praise God. But if not, they should be able to feel like I want to go here, not just for the academics, but I want to go here because they've got an awesome program, not just for the choir, not just because of biology, but yeah. I can stretch my legs on the track. You know, I, I can I can go out and do something on the court and, and be successful. Can I add to that? Can yeah. I add to that quick, G? I, I, I would, and I agree with you, Austin. I grew up in Bermuda where I went, and I was a cricketer, right? In Bermuda, we have something called cup match, which is like the largest sporting event on the island, right? And I was a really good cricketer. And so my girl, as a little boy who was actually not really raised in the church like that, like that, because mm -hmm. I could have played on Sabbaths, but I wanted to be so good that – they would change the trials, the, the 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 pathway to get in order to play because I was so good. Like that was my thought process. And right. so I'll one of my girls, G, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna confess it. I believe it's gonna happen. One of my girls is to win a championship with a professional team or a collegiate team um, as an administrator, as a director of play engagement or as a chaplain, right? And yeah. I believe I'm also called to challenge athletes in our space because because we've never even envisioned because of our limited thinking, what it would look like if our athletes were so good that they say, you know what? I don't want to play NBA games on Friday nights because the LeBron of the right. league is at right. the advent. You know, they're going to change stuff, but that's not how we think. What we did as fathers, no, nah, we didn't, but previous generations of fathers did, is they celebrated LeBron and went, watched the Super Bowl on Sunday, but we never created alternate avenues for our kids to get mm -hmm. the exposure to be great so that we could celebrate them. And that right. is problematic. Right. And so I think we need to leave with an apology at some point and then create systems that heal. Yeah. And I love that because for us, man, we've got so many talented young people. Anybody who's listening, man, we got some folk who are talented who wanted to play. And I do believe this, man, th there can be somebody who speaks up on some social justice issues as a college student that can be the one of the best players in the country and make change. So I, I love that. I love that. So, so what I hear you saying, Doc, is that that these students were positioned um, to clog up a system. They was they, they were positioned to where they were able to to make a decision that would shut something down. I saw also still in the athletic realm, I saw when the Phoenix Suns wanted Charles Barkley that he wouldn't go until they recognized uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. And so they made that change so they can get Charles Barkley. And wow. I think the question for us is wow. where are all the where are all the, the spaces in life? where it narrows down to a point that there's some black person in the way and that black person can take a stand and have something change. I, I, I love the fact of what Rusty uh, meant uh, to NASCAR and where are we? It's not just sports, but we ought to recognize all the places in life where we're positioned to where, oh, it is our time. This is me. Yeah. Oh, I am yeah. in a position that Esther was in it's at such yeah. a time as this. This is where I'm supposed to be, and this is where I'm supposed to take my stand. And we ought to kind of try to figure out where those places are, and when we find ourselves there, not to just sit down and get along to go along, go along to get along, but to go ahead and stand up, just like uh, uh, LeBron, just like uh, um, the Mizzou players, just like uh, Esther, I mean, just yeah. like Charles Barkley. We got to yeah. find those places, though, man, and recognize when we're there. Just like Barry Black, right? I mean, and we celebrate him now, right? But the reality is, he, as he tells the story, when he first transitioned out of traditional pastoral ministry, people are questioning, like, what are you doing, man? I don't know if that's the way you should go. And so I think that reminds us, right, that the road less traveled is typically one that may be critiqued by those who are going to the typical road, right? So, uh, and you mentioned something, Gene, that's important. You talked about the worlds coming together. Critical race theory actually offers a framing for that too. They call it interest convergence, all right? Because some people aren't going to do the right thing for the right reason, but they'll do it when, the, when there's a merging of their interests with yours, where all of a sudden now it's advantageous to say, hmm, I think we will change that. You know what I'm saying? Like one of my propositions, I want to propose that the NFL actually starts to play the Black National Anthem during the NFL, during the NBA games. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's one of my suggestions for Roger Goodell. You know what I'm saying? Like interest convergence may cause that if the brothers say, you know what, we're not playing until, right? So again, like some people will do the right thing for the right reason, but most people typically do it because they have to. And that's, that's fr it's frustrating for me as a leader. I want us to address needs before they become demands, but the reality is most of the leaders that I've seen actually have to make change typically do it under the rest. And that's actually what the book Campus Uprisings actually highlights. And it also includes not just Mizzou, but it also includes uh, Howard University. So my co-editors are uh, Dr. Kimmett Shockley and Dr. Ivory Tolson. 
Um, Dr. Ivory Tolson uh, is a scholar who's written some great books on, uh, one is called uh, No BS, No Bad Stats. Uh, Dr. Kimish Shafi is a Pan-Africanist, does some really great work in that space. Uh, and the book really gives context for Howard, but it also gives context for Andrews University's uprising, the It Is Time movement. So there's a chapter in there from President Luxon. There's a chapter in there that includes uh, wow. uh, 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 Polite. Uh, so there's an Adventist connection to it. So make sure you go and get a copy of that book, Teachers College Press, which is one of the top press, academic press in the, in the, in the world. Uh, and it includes the voices of students, staff, faculty, administrators, senior administrators, uh, and, and, and everybody else in between. So I think it's a timely project for multiple reasons. Hey, and, and Ty, man, I, you know, I was just going about to lead into that, man. We, we ask all of our guests, you know, tell us about how we can find your books. Where can we find you on social media? I'm, I'm a young preacher. I want to bring you in virtually uh, until it's time for us to start flying again, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast. Where, where can we where can we find you, man? Hey, before you do it too quickly, I, I would love for you to just go through your books. I mean, okay. you don't have to spend five minutes on each, but if you can just t tell yeah. us about the books that you've been uh, a part of. Sure. So it's funny, man. I have five now, man. And uh, the first one, um, I believe the first one that dropped was um, uh, 12 Shades of Man was a project that I uh, had the opportunity to to edit with Jeremy Anderson and Eric Thomas uh, from our prayer line. And uh, it has a powerful, powerful uh, chapters, 12 different chapters from 12 different black males, uh, 11 black males, one brother, a Latino brother. And um, that's a project that I think is you want to get spirit reign. It's the publisher. Check that one out. Uh, I also have a book with my wife. Uh, it's called So Amazing, Her Story, Secrets to Finding and Keeping a Great Man. And I promise you, it's really not about me. Like the great man is, 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 is Christ. Um, but we do have a very powerful and unique story um, that, you know, is his own sort of ministry. So we have a ministry called So Amazing Life Today. And if you see the shirt, it says salt, right? That's the name of the church. So So Amazing Life Today is the, is the, is the meat of the sauce. Um, but salt, salt City Church is what we will leave here in Columbia, Missouri. And it's a global movement of raising up churches, particularly in cities like this one where you don't have black churches, right? Um, in the Midwest, there are many cities like Madison, Wisconsin and others where you only have state conference uh, churches, and but you have young adult Christians who pass through these cities for, for graduate school, for work opportunities, but a lot of times they don't stay long enough to raise up something. So we've been blessed to be here for eight years to raise up something that is substantial that will outlive us. And so that's one of my highlights uh, of this work and being in this space. Uh, and then we have, uh, I have another book called uh, Border Crossing Brothers. Black Males Navigating Race, Place, and Complex Space. Uh, that actually emerged out of my dissertation, which was an award-winning dissertation that won uh, a dissertation award with the American Educational Research Association. And the book actually won two awards. That's by uh, Peter Lang Press. Check that one out. Uh, and then uh, this last year, I've dropped two books, one uh, called uh, Choosing, to Te Choosing to Teach, Choosing to See. Um, I believe the subtitle, top subtitle is like, um, readings for those who are uh, entering the noble profession of education. Uh, and that's actually a project I led uh, with one of my graduate students, Dr. Ransford Pinto is actually a doc student of mine from the, from Ghana, the great country of Ghana. And he's actually on uh, the second uh, author editor on that one. And then finally, uh, Campus Uprisings, which is the project that, um, that we've talked most about today, uh, how student activists and collegiate leaders resist racism and create hope by Teachers College Press. I'm working on a book now that's actually gonna be focused on the study I did for athletics. Uh, for the NCAA, I had a grant in 2014, 2015. So that's a book that's going to come out. I'm also currently working on a project in South Africa and uh, a documentary on two Olympic athletes, uh, South African athletes there. So lots of different moving parts. You can find me uh, on social media. Just find me at, uh, at, at Dr. Ty Douglas, D-R-T-Y-D-O-U-G-L-A-S. That's IG, Twitter, uh, Facebook as well. We have a page, So Amazing Life Today. Um, and, you know, you can find me in that space. And, of course, my website, drtydouglas.com. And I feel free to reach out. You know, we seek to just be a blessing to people, man. We seek to love on people and we try to be able to leave people better than we found them. So I hope that as you've been listening today, that's been your experience. Hey, Ty, man, I'm I'm, I'm behind a little bit. I, I turned around on my bookshelf, man. I was able to find two of the books, man. But it looks like I'm just I'm, I'm counting yeah. slowly. I, 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 I only can count up to two, man. So I got to catch yeah. up. And hey, hold them up again. You hold them up again, man. What I got to catch up, man. I got to get some more of the books, man. 12 Shades yep. of Man and <laughs> so, so amazing. amazing. Yeah, yeah. I have this one in my hand. This is the Campus Uprising one. You can All see right. it, man. And we got we got a we got a bossy uh, a bossy book trailer for it, man. That was done um, by my guy, man, Javen Cornelius of Shoeshine Media. So um, yeah, we got some. We're trying to change the game a little bit, man. I'm always trying to get to the people. So you know, the books are not just for the the, the academy, but the books are also. Uh, to try to make it relevant to our people in the streets. And so I use book trailers and media to also do that. Sure. 
Yo, for those who are listening, man, we're gonna make sure for our on our on our Facebook and YouTube, we're gonna drop the links for the books for, on Amazon, uh, anywhere else we can find them, man. We'll make sure that we get those links out to you for sure. All right. Well, we're so glad that y'all joined us today on the AP. Listen, I know you've heard something that can help you in your life, that can help you through the time that we're going through. Um, and you know somebody that can use it. So share it with them. And when you share it with them, tell them to share it with their family and tell them, tell the family to share it with the friends. And so that we can all benefit from what uh, Dr. Ty brought to the table on today. You've been listening to the Academy podcast with Austin and G. Hit the subscribe button and come again. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and of course, Facebook. Oh yeah, and if you know someone who could use the information you just gained, take a minute to share. Much love from the AP. Peace.